So good evening to everyone and uh, welcome to this uh, uh, webinar, which is part of the uh, uh, series hosted by uh, myself and uh, Sara Pinicino on uh, uh, constitutionalism in a liberal, uh, liberal democracies. Um, let me just introduce myself very uh, quickly to those of you that uh, uh, don't know me. Um, I'm Justin Frazzini. I'm uh, an adjunct professor of constitutional law here at SAIS Europe. I'm also the director of the Center for Constitutional Studies and Democratic Development and also an uh, associate professor of comparative public law at the McCormick University in Milan. Um, I'd like to underline the fact that this uh, seminar series is uh, a spin-off of a research project of the International Association of Constitutional Law on constitutionalism in uh, liberal democracies, which I co-coordinate uh, with my colleague from Argentina, Ricardo Ramirez uh, Calvo uh, from the University of uh, Sant Andres. Uh, now, uh, it really is uh, a pleasure uh, to have as our uh, speaker tonight, who will be talking about illiberal democracy or populist authoritarianism, the cases of Poland and Hungary, Professor Wojciech uh, Sadurski. Um, Wojciech is, a, is the Chalice Professor of Jurisprudence at the University of Sydney, and he's also a uh, Professor of Law at the University of uh, Warsaw. Um, but Wojciech also has a strong connection with Italy, uh, e parla molto bene l'italiano, uh, because from 1999 uh, to 2009, he was uh, a professor of uh, legal theory and also for a period also directed the Department of Law at the European Institute in Florence. And indeed, a uh, little anecdote, uh, it was back in 1999 when I was a young and among other things, much thinner PhD student, uh, that I met uh, Professor Sadorsky for the first time when the CCSDD organized a conference on constitutional justice and democratic development in Central and Eastern Europe, and, uh, and Wojciech was uh, here in Bologna. Uh, today, we can only virtually host him in Bologna. My hope is to have him back in presence uh, uh, sometime, uh, sometime soon. Uh, I'm sure most of you know that uh, uh, Wojciech has uh, published copiously, uh, he is the author of several books, uh, including Constitutionalism and Enlargement of Europe and Equality and Legitimacy, both uh, published with Oxford University Press. Uh, and most significantly in the context of this uh, uh, webinar, he has published uh, Poland's uh, Constitutional uh, Breakdown, uh, a land landmark book that was uh, uh, published in uh, in 2019. And if I may, I'm looking at the back cover here and I would like to read one of the comments, uh, which is the following. Wojciech Sadurski has written the kind of legal thriller uh, you might uh, uh, wish were fiction. Uh, in just a few years, Poland has transformed from a model state to a pariah. And Sadurski's account shows how and why in ethnographic and legal detail. Even the legal, ever the legal theorist, Sadurski rises above the specificity of the case to offer general reflection, substantial analysis, and a series of important lessons we can learn from the collapse of a constitutional democracy. This book is a haunting cautionary tale of our populist moment. And this was written by uh, Kim Lane Shepley, who together with uh, uh, Wojciech uh, is a global scholar of the International Association of Constitutional Law. Now, there are, uh, it's, this comment by Kim allows me to underline one of the two reasons why I think we couldn't have a better speaker tonight. Um, as Kim underlines, um, Wojciech is both a legal theorist, but he's also an expert of comparative uh, constitutional law. And I don't want anybody to be misled by the title tonight. We are not lumping together uh, Poland and, and Hungary. Uh, what Wojciech will do is obviously as comparative con constitutionalists do, is to underline some of the common threads of what is happening in Poland uh, and in Hungary, 
But at the same time, thanks to his deep and detailed analysis, he will also underline some important differences. Allow me to just underline one of the many. The fact that in Hungary, uh, we are in the presence of a uh, regime that was able to change uh, the constitution, uh, whereas in Poland, uh, that has not happened. And what we have are actions that are going against the constitution and causing issues uh, related to uh, to the rule of law. So um, given the fact that there's often a little bit of superficiality, especially when we're dealing with countries from Central and Eastern Europe, this tendency to uh, sort of, as I say, lump them all together as though they were all uh, the same thing, something that we would never do with other regions of the world. And that's certainly not something that, that Professor Sodorsky would do. The second uh, reason why it is such a pleasure and a privilege to have Wojciech as our speaker tonight is because uh, Wojciech is not just an academic, he's not just a constitutionalist, but he's also, to use uh, an expression used by a, a, a young colleague of ours, Zap Lazarus, a constitutional actor, because uh, Professor uh, Sadowski has been an outspoken critic of uh, the actions that have been taken by uh, the ruling party uh, in Poland. He has expressed harsh criticism both to, towards PIS and towards the uh, state television. Um, I should underline that all of these are public issues, political issues, so what he, is, what he has done has been that of expressing an opinion in the context of public uh, discourse something that we all know is protected by Article 10 of the European Convention on Human Rights and Wojciech, correct me if I'm mistaken, also by Article 54 of the Polish, uh, of the Polish Constitution. The result of this, however, and this is uh, worrying, is that uh, uh, the uh, ruling party and the state television have filed lawsuits against Wojciech um, for defamation, but not just civil defamation, but also something that we thought had fallen into desuetude, uh, criminal uh, defamation. And uh, uh, I simply want to underline the fact that here we are in the presence of someone that has not just done a profound research on these topics, but has been an outspoken critic and is sort of endeavouring to try and change the way uh, things are working in, in this country, so for this, so in, in, in Poland. And from this point of view, it really is great to have him as a, as a speaker. Uh, just uh, very quickly, the housekeeping rules. Uh, Wojciech will talk for 35, 40 minutes. Uh, I think he will be using some slides, uh, after which we will go into a Q&A session. And I would simply ask you to write the questions in the Q&A box and not the uh, chat box. And please also write your name so that we know who uh, the question has been posed by. Uh, Wojciech, benvenuto. Great to have you. The floor is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. My, my very, very, very big thanks to Professor Frosini and his team at SAIS and at uh, Johns Hopkins University in Bologna. It's a great honor, great pleasure. Of course, the only worry is that I cannot be there uh, face to face. But Justin, I, I, I need to warn you that I will claim my post lecture dinner sooner or later. So keep your uh, representation budget ready for it. I'll call up in Bologna and we'll have a nice Chenna in CM. Uh, but thank you so very much. Uh, now, just before writing the last notes for this presentation, I received the most recent issue of VDEM report. VDEM stands for Varieties of Democracy, and it's one of the most respectable uh, think tank or institute uh, analyzing successes and failures of democracy around the world. Uh, and VDEM, in its very recent report, March 2021, basically provides us with lots of information, which basically confirm what we have known all along. And that is that these are bad times for democracy around the world, that we note net decline, that, the, that year after year, uh, countries in which democracy deteriorates 
prevail over countries where democracy improves. So in his executive summary, Vidan says, the global decline during the past year, global decline in liberal democracy, that is, uh, over the past years, uh, 10 years is steep and continues in 2020, especially in the Asia Pacific region, Central Asia, Eastern Europe, and Latin America. The level of democracy enjoyed by the average global citizen in 2020 is down to levels last found around 1990. 1990, so let me remind you, it's when we, when we talked uh, about third wave of democratization after communism, after apartheid, after autocratic regimes in East Asia or in South America. And then Vidan continues, electoral autocracy, that is autocracy emerging out of elections, remains the most common regime type. Together with closed autocracies, no real elections, they number 87 states, home to 68% of the world population. And this very grim assessment is by and large uh, confirmed by other reports of this type. For example, recent Freedom House report. Let me just read, and maybe now is the time for me to share a screen. So please bear with me just for a moment. Uh, and uh, I just... Okay, uh, is it? Okay, uh, Justin, can you just nod that it can be seen, this slide? Sorry, I can't hear you. Yes, although the, yeah. yeah thank you so much. So going to this, to this uh, report, VM Democracy Report, uh, I have quoted the uh, phrases which are here. Let me go to something more relevant to our discussion today. It says that states in Eastern Europe, such as Hungary, Poland, and Serbia, have continued their downward decline after continued assaults on the judiciary and restrictions on the media and civil society. And if you look at the numbers right at the bottom left of this screen, uh, really, uh, uh, which, which I copied from a table of top, of top 10 decliners, if I may say. So Poland and Hungary are top two decliners, states in which decline in quality of democracy has been the steepest. Of course, they, they don't represent the bottom in terms of the actual sort of like screenshot approach. They are not by a long shot the worst in terms of autocratic rule. However, the decline there has been the highest. Poland followed very closely by Hungary. And as, uh, as the report continues, while, Hungary, while Hungary's ongoing autocratization is still conspicuous, Poland has taken over the dubious first position with a dramatic 34 percentage point decline on the liberal democracy index, most of which has occurred since 2015. So uh, yeah, dubious first position, dubious indeed. Now let me, before I move on, now this is sort of like a uh, throat clearing introduction to the, uh, to the presentation. Let me make two caveats about my presentation. So the first caveat is about general approach. I will take very much a, a, a sort of overview approach, a bird's eye view look, rather than going into any detailed analysis on any particular issue. So it will be more of a fox than a, of a hedgehog. And it's deliberate. I think that will be inter more interesting for our discussion. I'll be happy to elaborate on any of these issues later on in discussion, but I just want to have this broad but shallow approach. And the second caveat, uh, which refers to something that Justin mentioned in the introduction, is that the paper really will not deliver on what the title promised. So I'm here a little bit on false pretenses. Uh, there is a certain deception in it. Almost everything here will be about Poland, because I know it much better. However, to make good for this defect, 
I will right at the outset underline some major differences between Poland and Hungary. Because in much of the literature, Poland and Hungary sort of comes in one breath. Uh, it, is, it is seen as a package. And in many ways, there are good reasons for it. I mean, there are a number of very similar developments regarding relationship to courts, to public media, et cetera, which are similar. But there are also important dissimilarities. So whatever I say about Poland can be perhaps extrapolated into Hungary, but mutatis mutandis, that is taking into account at least some of the following very important differences between the two cases. And I list some of these differences here. Uh, the uh, uh, Hungarian populism is in power for five years more than in Poland. So the duration itself makes a difference. I think that Orban enjoys much higher social support than Kaczynski in Poland. Opposition, the opposition- Wojciech, sorry, sorry to yes. interrupt you, but that's they're telling me that the, 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 the vision of the slides is not the most ideal, that the large slide is not that big. If you are able to put it into presentation form. Okay. I think that might be better. Okay. Sorry for the interruption. No, presentation yeah. four. Isn't it now in present? I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, okay. Uh, let no, me... Don't worry. If, you, if it's not possible, we can leave it like that. Don't worry. Mm, I thought that it is presentation mode. Okay. They're suggesting to me to, to stop and to reshare again. Okay. I'll do that. Okay. So... Sorry, Wojciech. It's just so... No, no. It's can... okay. So I stop share. Yeah. I don't see slides, and I go back to share screen. Uh, I share my PowerPoint. Uh, That's it. That's great now. But what about, because, ah, okay. Is it good now? Yes, it's perfect. I think it's, yeah, now it's better there. Everyone's telling me it's perfect. So that's resolved the problem. Mm, and I just wanted to, is it, is it now bad again? No, that's gone back to how it was before. Ah, okay, so sorry about it. I know what, I know what happened. Sorry, I'll, I'll just go over all this again and I'll stick to the previous. Uh, okay, is it good now? Perfect, perfect. Okay, very good. Thanks. So, yeah. so <clears throat> going back to the comparison, so there is an, a factor of duration, scale of social support. Until recently, Polish opposition towards peace was much, towards law and justice party was much stronger than Hungarian opposition towards Fidesz. Although this may have changed really recently because even earlier today, I've read that there is a broad uh, anti-Orban opposition in Hungary, which includes parties starting from Jobbik on the right and ending with social democrats, which was facilitated by Jobbik's sort of gravitation towards the center. But until recently, I think that it is fair to say that Hungarian opposition has been much more dispersed, disorganized, demoralized than the opposition in Poland. Now I have put in bold uh, letters the aspect of constitutional entrenchment something that uh, Justin mentioned while introducing this paper, because for us constitutional lawyer, lawyers, it is perhaps the most important issue. And that is that Orban enjoys, has enjoyed twice in two recent terms of office, a constitutional supermajority, and he managed to entrench much of the changes into the constitutional text, something that uh, Jaroslav Kaczynski was unable to do. So rather than changing the constitution, he had to break the constitution and to introduce changes through sub-constitutional laws. Until recently, uh, or, uh, Orbán's Fidesz was part of EPP and the European Parliament, uh, something that has changed only recently, which for a long period of time gave Orbán much stronger embeddedness in the EU because EPP is one of the two main mainstream uh, political families, again, something that Kaczynski's party uh, didn't enjoy being sort of relegated to ECR, which is more, more of a fringe. There is a big difference when it comes to religious issues and the church-state 
relationship because Hungary is much more secular than Poland and therefore the support of institutional church for the ruling party counts for much less in Hungary than it does in Poland. Media, uh, in Poland we still have a very vibrant and important and independent segment of commercial media, something that basically for all practical purposes in Hungary disappeared. And there is also a big difference in the relationship between the politics and economy in Hungary and in Poland. In, in Hungary, basically all economic interests are connected to the party and to Fidesz, to Orban, and are sort of part of what Balint Magyar famously called the mafia state. In Poland is still not quite true. And maybe it will not never come through. There are some very important businesses, banking uh, groups, uh, financial interests, which are not connected to the law and justice. So this is, this is, if you like, the general list of fundamental differences which, which we need to keep in mind. Now, we should go into, in order, in order to explain what's going on now in Poland, we should go back to, no, sorry, for some reason, Okay, we should go back to October 2019, when quote unquote Polish sovereign has decided to renew the electoral mandate, mandate to law and justice. Party. I mean, a, a, a purely, if you like, semantic uh, caveat, I may occasionally use the word peace because this is Polish acronym for law and justice party, and that's how it's usually known. So when I say peace did this, peace did that, I do not mean peace as in P-E-A-C-E, -E, but peace as a Polish acronym to the ruling party, which is Law and Justice Party, presided over by Jarosław Kaczynski. And it has won the parliamentary election in the, after having served full first term and won resoundingly, having received two, more, two million more votes than in previous election which is quite a successful party in power, uh, and having received uh, more votes, more popular vote than any other party in any elections in Polish democracy since 1989. And in terms of uh, seats in the parliament, it translated into absolute majority. On the other hand, one has to emphasize that three democratic opposition parties, because there is one other extreme right-wing opposition party which doesn't count for, uh, for this particular argument, three parties in the opposition to peace combined one more votes, 4% uh, more than peace. Uh, however, it didn't translate into a uh, majority in the parliament because they didn't appear, they didn't run as part of a strong uni unified coalition and Polish system of proportional representation as in much of Europe clearly favors strong big partisan coalition and certainly disfavors small and medium parties running on their own. And with the turnout, which was unusually high by Polish standards of over 60%, it has been huge victory of Jarosław Kaczynski and uh, Prime Minister Morawiecki. This victory has been repeated a year later when Andrzej Duda, the candidate, presidential candidate supported by peace, won, even though he won in the second round with the thinnest of margins over Rafał Trzaskowski, mayor of Warsaw, nevertheless, he won. So one may say that the sovereign decided to renew and renew unambiguously the electoral legitimacy of Jaroslav Kaczynski and his party to rule. But of course, to say sovereign did this, sovereign did that is uh, a great oversimplification. And in saying that and using this formula, I am sort of half ironically parroting the official propaganda, which is precisely that. If you have a majority, then it means that the sovereign wants it. 
In fact, this happened despite things such which has happened in the four years prior to the election, of which I'll very quickly enumerate some of the matters, such as paralysis of the Constitutional Tribunal and reducing it to the role of a will, willing uh, facilitator of the ruling party. Nearly full subjection of all the judges uh, in Poland through the uh, punitive system of disciplinary liability. Erosion of any semblance of independence by the prosecutor's office with public prosecution becoming some sort of protection racket for the uh, ruling party and its uh, acolytes. Civil service has been totally re-politicized. The electoral system has lost its independence as it had before. The lawmaking ha ha has been often turned into a farce with basically no role of any consultation, the role for the uh, opposition. Public media had been turned into uh, instruments and I have to watch carefully what I'm saying because I don't want another defamation suit, right? But it has been turned into, uh, into a device of incredible propaganda. Mm -hmm. Poland has been placed at the margins of the European Union, having again dubious primacy of being the first state against which Article 7 procedure has been launched. That has been then followed by Article 7 procedure against Hungary. And I could go on and on and on. And I could continue this litany of various misdeeds that peace did in the first term of office, uh, which would probably take the entire class. So you excuse me, probably you will even thank me for not continuing. However, the sovereign reappointed the, uh, this party and its candidate to presidency for the second time. So in a way, one may say it, it, it depends to what constitutional scholars call consolidated populism. It's not just the fact, it's a populism which is re-elected by reasonably free and fair elections into the second term of office, into ter second consecutive term of office. That's what the sovereign did. But I'm coming back to this issue of the sovereign because one thing which one must keep in mind is that all this happened against the background of unprecedented level of polarization, of political polarization in Poland. You could see the numbers of percentage given to opposition parties versus peace, the law and justice party, and its two minor coalition parties. It's almost 50-50. And most importantly, this polarization belongs to what American sociologists and political scientists uh, Seymour Martin Lipset called segmental polarization. That is, cleavages more or less almost perfectly correlate with each other along different dimensions rather than partly only overlapping, which is very dangerous because the society is really divided. And this polarization, in my view, has two Fundamental, uh, three fundamental characteristics. So, A, it is largely class-based with clear correlation between factors such as level of ed education, level of income, and uh, whether you live in small town and village as opposed to big towns. It is highly negative in the sense that the intensity of hatred towards the other side is higher than the intensity of uh, approval for your own people. And it is highly moralized in the sense that people view each other not just as mistaken or endorsing wrong policies, but as being evil, having some fundamental moral defects, or if not evil, at least very stupid. And now in Political science and sociology of populism, we know very well that polarization favors populism. That the more polarized a society is, the more likely it is that populists will be successful. 
but in itself, it just provides a certain background information. It doesn't necessarily provide explanation. So what are the explanations for this, for the fact uh, that in Poland, and again, Mutatis Mirandis in Hungary, uh, in the center of Europe, uh, two populist regimes, which openly dismantle fundamental institutions of democracy and the rule of law, get re-elected term after term. Now, within the, again, theory of populism, or sorry, more generally, theory of democracy, a theory which tries to explain both the successes and failures of democracy, they are largely two approaches, what may be called structural approach and agentic approach, or the approach which emphasizes agents. So why structural explanations focus on societal demand, on background for politics in economy, culture, tradition, and on long-term factors, agentic explanations focus on short-term factors, on inner politics itself, and most importantly, on supply. Not on social demand, but on political supply of policies and ideas. And I can understand why generally it seems that structural explanations are somehow more respectable or seem more serious. Nevertheless, I think that it's a big mistake to underestimate agency-related explanation, because it, it seems to me that in the case of Poland, structural explanations, say about economic anxieties, etc., very badly underdetermine what has happened. So that fail to fully explain successes of populist authoritarian. So we, so rather than focusing on demand, let us focus on supply. And when it comes to supply, the point is that a very important part of explanation of success of Jaroslav Kaczynski and his party has been that they have been successful in meeting certain anxieties by providing people with three very important themes of, or ideas which can be presented as three entities. So first it's anti-elite, which of course is part of the traditional toolkit of any populace around the world. An idea, you know, an idea of draining the swamp, whether it's in Washington DC or Budapest, Hungary or Warsaw, Poland or Rome, Italy for that matter. You know, that there is this elite that has been ruling for much too long, that they are totally insensitive to the real needs and interests of real people. They are cosmopolitan, they are liberal, they feel that they are better, they are arrogant, complacent, etc. And now we will change all that. And no matter that Jaroslav Kaczynski has been very much part of this Warsaw elite for something like four decades, that doesn't matter. What matters is, he, uh, is that he managed to convince his audience, his constituency, that he's outside there who will remove the traditional elite. The second anti is anti-others. That is your good old traditional xenophobia. In 2015, it was mainly anti-immigrants and more specifically anti-Muslims. So in this, of course, he joined forces with, uh, with Orman. Uh, when the issue of anti-immigrant xenophobia more or less exhausted its potential for populist propaganda, it was replaced by many other types of xenophobia. Z xenophobia about some internal others, mainly LGBT, but also external others, especially Germany. Why Germany, you ask? No idea, you know, I mean, Germany, why not Russia, for example, you know, which would be much more you know, like attractive focus of mobilizing people's hatred. No, but it was Germany because Germany was identified as being the, as having the most crucial and at the same time invidious effect on the workings of the European Union, which of course criticizes Poland from time to time. And finally, the third anti was anti-modern, has been anti-modernism, make it anti-enlightenment, 
an idea that we are seeing a decline of our traditional way of life with traditional family roles, with traditional gender roles, with a special privilege role for religion. And then you have all this secularism, which is invading our way of life. And this has been one of the most important themes in Poland, at least, which I think is much, much more important than, say, appeals to economic anxieties. There are these sort of cultural anxieties and all that, all these themes have been infused with a great deal of paranoia, which for many years at the beginning of the rule was powered by the hor horrific crash of Polish governmental air aircraft near Smolensk uh, on 10th April 2010, which was then presented in all sorts of fantastic conspiracy theories as result resulting from some plot between then Prime Minister Tusk and Russians, of course. And even though very few people seriously believe that this conspiracy theory has any semblance of truth, nevertheless, it became more an article of faith. If you support peace, if you support Kaczynski, if you are loyal to your leader, you must believe in these stories about Smolensk. And there were many other aspects of paranoia uh, more recently about various other plots. Whenever, whenever something, whenever there is another corruption scandal, it immediately comes as a plot again with Germans usually positioned in, in some main roles. And of course, I'm using the concept of paranoia, not in a, a clinical sense, God forbid, but in this political sense, as it was used in the classical 1964 essay by Richard Hofstadter on paranoid style in American politics. So that is what you had. And that completes a general outline of this rhetorical and narrative supply that Kaczynski provided, and more importantly, he provided as part of one sort of sleek package, which was strong, which was attractive, which had great sort of intensity. And unfortunately, the other side, liberal Democrats, has, have not matched this narrative with anything of similar attractiveness. If anything, our responses were at the same time meek and arrogant. So, which come to think of it is the worst possible uh, combination. They were meek because we always acted within the agenda designed for us by Kaczynski. We, we never managed to impose our own agenda on public discourse. It was always defensive. It was always in reply to, uh, to, to Kaczynski's people. But also it was arrogant because in contrast to Kaczynski and Peace, who kept telling people, look, you are just fine. You don't have to change. You don't like Jews? Don't worry, you know. Uh, you are entitled to it. You don't like LGBT? That's who you are. Don't be ashamed of it. You are not educated? Don't you be embarrassed about it. You have this prejudice, this stereotype. This is who you are. Feel good about it. We seemed to sort of lift the bar to people and to tell them, well, you really should know better. You know, you should abandon some of your prejudice. You should become better and wiser. Even if we didn't say that in, all, in so many words. That has been the general message. And this is not a winning message, unfortunately. Now, these demands, this supply side, wouldn't explain the actual successes, political successes of law and justice, if it didn't align or resonate with demand. And on the demand side, on the sort of social expectations and anxieties that this particular narrative I have just described met, I would mention two main aspects. The first was, of course, as usual, is economic. 
And it wasn't so much demand by the poorest. It was rather by those who felt that they have been, relatively speaking, badly done by the economic transformation of Poland after the fall of communism and after establishment of market economy. So it was more of a relative rather than absolute deprivation. People felt that they were relative losers of transformation and that all the years of the rule of center left or liberals in Poland only consolidated the fundamental unfairness. And there was plenty of good reason to feel like that. But a good, if you like, good response to that would be a response by having the richer people fund through taxation the growth of public goods, especially healthcare and education, and maybe care for senior. But law and justice came up with a response which was absolutely ingenious in its simplicity. So that rather than building new schools, new kindergartens or new hospitals, you just gave cash handouts to people. Undifferentiated cash handouts. So you see this famous signature program of 500 plus, 500 zlotys, about 130 euro per each kid above the first kid in a family uh, monthly. So for people who had very low wages around or under national average, if you had three or four kids, it could easily double your disposable cash per month. And people loved it because it's a sort of instant a gratification. And the government loved it because building up new public goods takes time, strategic thinking, and lots of skills. Printing cash to give it to people is one of the easiest things you can do. Uh, and no, you know, of course, in the long term, it has produced and will produce important inflationary pressures. More importantly, it had anti-egalitarian and sort of reprivatization of social services effect. Because people who found themselves with extra cash had to compete with much richer people, but within the same stock of public goods. So of course, even those extra 500 or whatever wouldn't give them sufficient assets to win for the best schools, private schools, for the best hospitals and medical private with the richest one. Uh, so they were, but new public goods were not produced because there wasn't sufficient money. So that is, that's if you like the first, but until now it has been successful in terms of voter support. But there has been also the second aspect of, uh, on the side of demand. That is what I would call the question of identity, quest for identity or community. And especially after the fall of communism and sort of like ideological, void, gap created by that. And then in addition, after joining the European Union, which for many people may have raised some sort of identity dilemma. Am I a Pole? Am I a European? What does it mean to be one and the other? Uh, so there has been, especially in the younger generation, there has been a very strong quest and need for having answers to important questions about togetherness and community. And of course, we liberal Democrats have been traditionally very bad in this department because we have been obsessed by this fear that identity means oppression and community means unrestrained majoritarian. That is, the majority may do whatever it wants to minority. And Law and Justice Party beautifully colonized this field colonized this gap by presenting itself as a party of identity, as a party of community. Identity has become uh, equated or, 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 or analog, uh, compared, made similar to some sort of ethnic homogeneity. 
ethnic and religious. So, Polish identity is both ethnic and religious prevails and the winner takes all. That is the community. Community is of people who think similarly. I, I just saw the message that, that there were some problems with my internet, but I hope, but I hope that it- All okay, been. all okay. okay. Good, good. And that I think explains uh, this sort of, if we put these sort of two sides together, this explains successes of law and justice. And now just to follow up for a second about this issue of identity and community and the sense of dignity that you have to give people. I think this also explains why Polish brand of populism, and here I, I really don't know enough about Orban, but at least Polish brand of uh, populism becomes increasingly ideological. So there is this theory in studies about populism that populism is quote unquote thinly ideological. That its ideology is, ex ideology is extremely thin and basically insignificant. That it all boils down to power for the power's sake. And probably by and large it's true. But I think that as a result of the exhaustion of assets by peace to satisfy the economic uh, needs, which become the, the, the assets which become more and more, and the programs which become more and more unsustainable, they move to the second part, to the identity aspect, and become more and more ideological, and has its reflection in ever stronger synergy between the state and religion. Kaczynski very clearly exploits and benefits from strong support given to it by Roman Catholic Church. This ideological turn is reflected in more and more censorship-like imposition of orthodoxy in history, in how history is taught from the elementary schools ending at the universities and ending at lodging suits against uh, historians who dare to say things which are unpopular, for example, about Polish anti-Semitism. Uh, it has to do in the so-called politics of culture towards museums, towards cinema, film, towards theater, where this sort of orthodoxy is clearly imposed, usually by means of financial favors, but often with more or less open Censorship. So I feel that Poland is moving into a more and more ideological state. And if I were to define its shape, I would probably think that what they have in mind now is something like Salazar in Portugal. But maybe it's too far fetched. Now I'll be finishing soon. Let me just say a few words by. Uh, means of maybe certain generalizations. So what general lessons can be drawn from the Polish story and Hungarian story? So I think one is that we are facing the definite end of the transition paradigm. An idea that many of us, many of scholars had around 1990s, that now we are viewing a more or less uniform trajectory towards liberal democracy, I think that that's, that unfortunately, this beautiful dream has turned to be totally false. And we'll be seeing more and more situations of countries which either backslide or are stopped or sort of like arrested in their development at a certain plateau where there is no clear move towards more liberal democracy. Can we therefore talk about illiberal democracy? Of course not. In my view, a liberal democracy is an oxymoron because you simply cannot have democracy without at least some liberal rights related to free and fair election. Free and fair election is just, as Sami Zakharov wrote, just a proxy for something much more complex. And if you don't have all this freedom of speech, freedom of, as, 
assembly, freedom of association between the elections, then elections become sham. So it's more of a populist authoritarianism. It is populist for reasons which I presented earlier. It wants to be liked. It appeals to real demands and anxieties and needs and especially real negative feelings. But it is authoritarian because it dispenses with at least two very important pillars of democracy, which is division of powers or separation of powers or checks and balances. That is making sure that not all power is concentrated in one hand and the rule of law, which means that uh, the rulers have to subject themselves to the existing law rather than change it at any time they want. Now this authoritarianism, the move towards authoritarianism is, has been sort of invisible because it has been A, incremental, B, operated through interconnections between different changes rather than one single change, and C, without necessarily abolishing the uh, pre-existing institutions of democracy, but by simply filling them with new people or hollowing them from inside. But the fact that it was more sort of obscure than author authoritarianism, which emerge instantly doesn't make it any less authoritarian. What about the place of Europe here? Well, of European Union in particular? Well, I position myself between two extremes. One extreme says, well, Brussels or Luxembourg will bring or will restore democracy to Poland or to Hungary. And of course it won't. It can be only achieved on the ground. But I also reject another sort of extreme. And that is the view that uh, EU is totally hopeless when it comes to policing the rule of law and democracy in member states, that it always acts too late and too little. And I, I really don't buy this very negative view because I can see that there has been some very important changes already forced or prompted, say by some judgments of the Court of Justice of European Union. So I think that while EU doesn't have any toolkit which will simply restore democracy. It has ample tools which may make it more costly, politically speaking, for autocrats to carry on their policies and tools such as judgment of the Court of Justice, such as Article 7 procedures, such as rule of law framework, which give, which give uh, assets, argumentative or legal assets to Democrats. But the most important thing will happen on the ground and it is the role of opposition in both these two countries. And I would say, I'm not going to propose any particular political suggestions or instructions to the opposition because that's not the genre of today's presentation. But I think that at a, if you like, emotional or sentimental level, it is very important to resist two types of extremely different, of sort of extreme temptation. The temptation of self-satisfaction, or even like self-indulgence. We've done everything good and look how unlucky we are. And on the other side, self-flagellation. We are so wrong, we are so mistaken. We should take on some of those demands of populism. I think that between self-satisfaction and self-flagellation, there is a long, long distance which is filled by a critical self-reflection about the real deficits of liberal democracy as it has been practiced before. And, you know, what we have actually done wrong. So I would like really nearing the end of this uh, presentation, I would like to quote a great Polish philosopher, uh, Lesha Kowakowski, who wrote in one of his essays, sort of half in jest, the struggle between the devil and God in history is not a merry spectacle. The only comfort we have comes from the simple fact that we are not passive observers or victims of this contest, but participants as well. And therefore our destiny is decided on the field on which we run. And I would like to mention our destiny because it shows that the stakes today could not be higher. 
they want to take away our freedoms. You know, I mean, what we are watching is nothing less than the usual dystopias of Aldous Huxley or of uh, Margaret Atwood. Uh, this is what's at stake, our, our destiny. But nothing, nothing is inev inevitable. And we can see lots of uh, signs and symptoms and assets that the Democrats have in these countries. Uh, among other things, uh, I already mentioned the uh, independent media, there are NGOs. There are also, there's a wonderful new generation of municipal leaders in the greatest cities in the region. Uh, these cities are governed by Democrats against the uh, party ruling nationally. So whether, whether we look at mayor of Istanbul, Ekran Imamoglu, or new mayor of Budapest, Gergely Karachony, or president of Slovakia, Zuzana Chaputova, or mayor of Warsaw, Rafał Trzaskowski, or mayor of Gdansk, Aleksandra Dulkiewicz. You know, this is a new generation of leaders uh, and, and they are the future. Of course, it won't be easy. We know it won't be merry spectacle and they will, the autocrats will throw obstacles in our way. They will take us to courtrooms. They will throw various, uh, you know, defamation actions against us. They will use the so-called discriminatory legalism, which uh, an ex-president of Peru beautifully encapsulated, um, encapsulated by saying, everything for my friends, for my enemies, the law. So we'll be saying, we'll be on the receiving end. But I think that uh, in the end we will, we will win because let me just remind the words of Leszek Kowakowski, our destiny is decided on the field on which we run. And we will run and we will run and we will keep running. Thank you. Wojciech, thank you very much. And we already have some questions uh, coming through, so I'll immediately start the Q&A uh, session. So we have a question from Dante Fekete, who's one of our students. He's doing our Master's in European Public uh, Policy uh, here at SAIS Europe. And his question is, do you see Poland's demonization of Germany as pushed back to, towards the European Union, or is it a way of embracing Russia? Uh, no, I think it's not a way of embracing Russia. Uh, there may be a side effect, a negative side effect, is that Poland will find itself in the sphere of influence of Russia and that it will be unable or unwilling to get out of that sphere if we even further distance ourselves from the EU. But in contrast to Orban, I think that Polish leaders are genuinely anti-Russian. So even though they may have there is reasons to like several things about Putin, say his appeal to nationalism, to religion, to anti-LGBT, what he calls anti-homosexual propaganda, etc. These are all things which would be popular in Poland. At the same time, Poland is so anti-Russian that a genuinely and explicitly pro-Russian pro policy uh, cannot win in Poland. So I think it's, it's fundamentally you know, anti-German because it is relatively easy to generate uh, reaction against Germans while there can be presented, perhaps to some extent plausibly, as having the decisive voice in the European Union. So anti-German is a proxy for being anti-European Union. Okay. So we have a question from Ben Novak, who is a student again here at SAIS Europe, but he's in Budapest at the moment. And he asked the following question. Hungary and Poland kicked off a plan to launch a new rule of law institute together for the purpose of countering the EU's double standards. Can you envision this institute being used to export their interpretation of populist authoritarian jurisprudence across the EU landscape? What implications might this have for populist authoritarian movements across the EU? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Ben. Ben is my fellow drummer from Budapest. So good to, good to have you, Ben. Uh, and also correspondent for New York Times. That's my, right. 
My very short answer is absolutely nothing will happen out of it. It was just a propaganda gimmick. It was just ridiculous. It was idiotic. So here you had the situation in which foreign minister of Poland, Mr. Rao, with his Hungarian counterpart, declare, we set up an institute for the rule of law, which was meant to balance the rule of law pressure from Western Europe. And we will be putting forward our view on the rule of law. Furthermore, we will be depicting the violations of the rule of law in the West. The Netherlands, for example, was mentioned often because Dutch parliamentarians are particularly active in criticizing Poland and Hungary. Uh, but I think, you know, Ben, it's one of those ideas which died the next day. I've never heard about any, in, you know, any institutional movements to it, any uh, personnel being appointed, any initiative. Okay, I think we've got a bit of a, a bleep. I think they'll forget about it. It was a one day, perhaps I ended that my response because I, I've, I've heard another voice. Yeah, I think we had a little glitch. Sorry but... about it. So, so I just think that one shouldn't think about it even for a minute because it's a typical propaganda machine. It's not like a serious propaganda. It's not like Putin. It's not like Russia Today or Sputnik, which are huge and extremely well-run professional propaganda instruments, and they may have some influence on targets in the United States or in Western Europe. This is, you know, this is just a joke, I would say, and it should be treated with full contempt that it deserves. Hey, we have a question from Michele Di Bari from the University of Padova. He's actually one of the authors of our recent uh, special issue of Percorsi Costituzionali on constitutional oxymorons. And he <laughs> says, thanks a lot for your presentation. Considering what you said about the potential role of the EU, should our union start rethinking what EU membership means? Should the EU clearly demand to respect the principle of the rule of law, for example, when allocating EU economic resources? And allow me to connect this to another question by our colleague, Arthur Appleton, who was also asking what can and should the EU do to support democracy in Poland and Hungary? So, okay. so I would, uh, to the first two questions, I would say yes. Definitely, we now see that what was seen as a relatively clear set political conditionality as codified in Copenhagen criteria and then in article two uh, is simply insufficient of Treaty of European Union is simply insufficient because the rule of law uh, is often accused by the opponents of the rule of law as being an extremely vague concept. So they say, look, you cannot use such a vague concept to criticize it for this or that. Now, I think they are wrong in saying that, but the fact that, for example, rather than talking about the rule of law, Copenhagen criteria or article two, or then article 19 in, in the treaty, doesn't mention very specifically things such as judicial independence. And maybe judicial independence, even with the proviso, the judges shall not be appointed by politicians. No one knew before 2010 that it would be required uh, because EU and the then uh, candidate states in 2004, 2007 met more or less these criteria. But then we have a situation in which some member states start playing a game saying, well, we don't know what the rule of law is, so we can do anything. No, and the EU is outside its competence. Obvious thing is that Poland and Hungary wouldn't get into the EU if they applied today. That's a sad irony. But I think that, yes, now for the sake of future uh, enlargements, when we talk about especially Balkan states and perhaps Turkey, uh, this conditionality should be uh, codified in a much, much more specific way. So you have a number of relatively specific boxes to tick rather than these very general things. I mean, Copenhagen criteria talk about the rule of law, democracy and protect 
protection of human rights and protection of people belonging to minorities. I mean, it's too vague. Now, what, for the question, what can the EU do? Yes, I think that the EU, as implied by your question, should use its funds dispensation uh, based on rule of law conditionality. And it has promised that it would do. Uh, it has promised so in the resolution of the, uh, what was it, November last year. But of course, it has been immediately taken to Court of Justice of the EU by Poland and Hungary. And we see, we see what they say. Uh, so, so they will have about two years free reign. But I think, yes, funds disp dispensation should be uh, related to the rule of law and especially the compliance with the judgments of the Court of Justice of the European Union. So like a few years ago, I has been a big aficionado of Article 7, and I thought that Article 7 procedure may bring some serious reputational costs upon autocrats. I, I start believing that it doesn't. I mean, why not? Well, because it's a naming and shaming mechanism. But you cannot shame a shameless, right? And, and they are shameless, so they couldn't care less. But judgments of the Court of Justice is something else. So we, for example, just to give an example, we have a, an interim judgment of the Court of Justice about so-called disciplinary chamber in Polish Supreme Court. It's only an interim judgment, which is of course totally disregarded by the government. But we are yet to see the judgment on merits, which will, should come soon. And then they will have they, meaning Polish government, will not have much leeway to say, yeah, we are sort of complying, but not really. Either you comply or you not comply. And if you don't, then the commission should impose penalties. No, it should force, uh, it should somehow, ha, ha, uh, how should I say, lift political cost of non-compliance with common values. Okay, continuing still with this role of the EU, there's a question by Jacinta de la Cananea, uh, who okay. says, Hi Wojciech, I agree with your analysis, though it would be interesting to hear from you what may be the counter argument <laughs> to the argument that the value of the rule of law should not be considered only from the viewpoint of the founders of the EU, but also from that of the countries which exceeded in 2005. What are your thoughts My on that? best uh, regards to Professor De Cananea. Great to see you. Uh, so look, uh, I am a little bit nervous about that approach, because in theory, that's fine, you know, I mean, why should the values be frozen in time uh, at the point of the initial funding of the communities, uh, as opposed to it being a living tree, sort of developing with time and especially with new member states. But, you know, I think that this is a little bit, I mean, in theory, it's fine, in practice, it has exactly the same negative externalities as the concept of constitutional identity. Constitutional identity is the favorite concept of all the autocrats who say, look, we have our separate constitutional identity. This is protected by the European Union, so you shouldn't interfere with the way we deal with courts. There must be limits to it. And same with the rule of law. I think that when 10 Central European states acceded to the European Union in 2004 and 2007, they had, or at least they declared, exactly the same understanding of the rule of law as those which had already visible in the judgments of European Court of Justice, for example, and in various uh, communications by the Commission. So it is not like we joined the EU and changed it from the inside. We join the EU because we want at least some of its principle to act as pre-commitment, that we will not try to broaden that. And we won't try to say, yeah, rule of law is fine, but occasionally judges should be disciplined for their judgments. No. So I think that I would rather stick to this frozen meaning than allow this elastic, uh, elastic approach which unfortunately, even if as a scholarly matter may be justified, as a political matter would definitely be exploited by autocrats. Okay, you, among other things, you've answered a question by Marcin Kielanowski, 
who was implying that there might be different interpretations of the rule of law. So I think you've uh, kind of answered that question. Now we have a couple okay, of... Can I just say one word? Because yeah, I... sure. Because, thank you, uh, Professor Tiamoski. So I just want to add one thing. So, uh, of course, there can be different interpretations of the rule of law. Uh, it is one of those essentially contested concepts, like democracy, <laughs> rights, obviously. But that's not the point in current discussion. The point is, is there set an unquestionable minimum for the rule of law? And you know, we may even disagree about maximum, but within the minimum. So is rule of law, can the rule of law be reconciled with the fact that a judge will be disciplined for a judgment disliked by politicians? So that to the normal appellate process of trying to change the judgment, we add disciplinary system, which basically will punish judgments for just the, for ju uh, just the judges, for judgments which politicians don't like. Well, I can't imagine even the most, if you like, eccentric or iconoclastic conception of the rule of law, which would allow that. So let's agree to the minimum. And I think that this minimum is in a blatant way, breached both in Hungary and in Poland. Okay, now we have two people, Chan, uh, one of our students, and Ta Tariq, who are both asking about the very brief parallel that you made between Poland and Turkey. And if you could maybe elaborate a little bit on that. I'm on very thin ground here. The only parallel I made is that uh, Turks have elected a Democrat, an anti-Erdogan politician, to be mayor of their major city, not capital city, but major city, Istanbul. And so did Hungarians, and so did Warsaw people, and Gdansk people, and Poznan people, and Krakow people, basically all big cities in Poland are now ruled by strong opponents of law and justice. That is basically the only, uh, the only similarity that comes immediately to my mind. Another similarity may be that obviously compared to his predecessor, Erdogan, Erdogan exploits the religious aspect of his rule to a much higher degree than the Kemalist uh, politicians uh, before him uh, and has sort of abandoned this very, very extreme form of Ataturk's uh, laicite or secularity. You see similar, similar evolution in Poland. Well, Turkey has basically given up on its aspirations to join uh, EU, even though officially it's still designed as a potential candidate. Uh, so uh, I really don't want to pretend I know more about a country I know very little about. So I'd, I prefer to end it there. Um, still continuing on the issue on the role of, 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 of mayors, we have a quick question from Kai Lu Li, who is a PhD candidate majoring in urban politics and comparative politics. And uh, she says, I'm thrilled to hear that you highlighted the new generation of leaders, the mayors. Can you elaborate more on the role mayors and cities can play in making changes? Of course, everything depends on how their assets will be reduced by central government, which as in Poland or in Hungary, is very strongly at loggerheads with those new mayors, and probably it will be. So uh, we already have seen in Poland growing moves against direct flow of EU funds to the biggest cities. Um, the official rhetoric is, now these funds should be controlled by central government because they need mainly to go to the countryside and to small cities. And because they don't have sufficient, if you like, negotiating uh, resources, this should be distributed by central government. It has been very strongly condemned by a consortium of all major, of mayors of major Polish cities as an attempt to sideline major cities, and it is. So, well, they have a strong role over traditional 
sort of local issues, whether it's local transport, some extent uh, education, especially uh, elementary and secondary schools, and of course many other sort of you know plumbing and water supply, etc. Typical urban issues. I think that their political cloud should not be underestimated because even if in real terms, they cannot really do politics. Okay, they can go to Brussels and discuss in the commission, etc. but it will not translate into strong, real assets that they, but they have great political assets. I mean, they can appear every day on daily news on TV. And even if they talk about things which are more or less related to the city, they acquire national significance. So I showed here a photo of Alexander Radulkevich, who became mayor of Gdansk after the hor horrible murder of her predecessor by a deranged guy, uh, or by a murder of uh, Mr. Adamovich. So uh, this became, and what happens in Gdansk is of a national significance. And, you know, for example, there are things like, I mentioned that the government tries to spread some form of control or censorship of, over museums. But some museums are run by cities. So some very important politically sensitive, quote unquote, museums, which to people in liberal democracy may seem stupid. How can a museum be politically sensitive? But in a quasi-authoritarian state, everything becomes political. So for example, you have this museum of Second World War in Gdansk. And the whole management of this museum has been uh, fired by the mm, Minister of Culture because he claimed that this museum has certain pacifist ideology. A museum about war has a pacifist ideology and doesn't give enough justice to the courage of Polish military, etc., etc. And here there have been very clear conflicts between local government and central government. So I see, you know, in these fields that mayors have a big also political role which transcends the limits of their, of their jurisdiction, so to speak. Wojciech, allow me to, to abuse my position of chair a second to ask a question. And this is related to the legacy of communism and the single uh, party state. And I'm, I'm thinking also of a principle that would existed in, in constitutional law under communism, i.e. The, 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 the concept of unity of powers. How is, does, does that play a role at all in your opinion with respect to what's going on now in Poland? Well, maybe you'll be surprised, but my answer would be negative. Okay. I, do not see, I do not see that the trajectory of Poland's moving away from liberal democracy means that its trajectory towards some form of real communism, of, uh, with things which were before 1989. And one may, of course, try to engage in some psychological speculations that uh, Kaczynski, who is now 91, remembers from his memory the uh, communist days and that he has some form of nostalgia. I don't think that's right. Or even if it's right as an individual matter, which I don't think so, I don't think it's a useful uh, way of arguing. About it. I think they are moving away from liberal uh, democracy, but not towards anything that resembles from uh, that resembles communism. So, for instance, I don't think that they want to take away some rights. For example, right of emigration, just to the country, right of emigration favors. Uh, favors local autocrats because some of the most critical and dependent and uh, educated people will leave, you know, which will reduce the uh, constituency of critics. Uh, uh, that is true that what we see is combination of all powers in one hand, but I don't think that Kaczynski or Orban for that matter really want to have a formally speaking one party state. Of course, they want their party to be some sort of 
uh, what, what's the word, um, strongly majoritarian uh, leading ruling party to, to have their party a little bit like it used to be in Mexico with the Revolutionary Institutional Party or Congress Party in India, or you had the fact, or ANU in South Africa these days, when you could have many, many other parties, but only one party is hegemon. And they, they de facto only one party can win. And I, want, I think that both Kaczynski and Orban are moving in the same direction in which they want to tilt the playing field against newcomers or opponents and in favor of incumbents. But I do not think they necessarily want somehow to, de to, to disband or to ban other parties. So I wouldn't go along this road. Okay, we'll check. There are loads of questions coming in, and I, I'm going to have to apologize to some of you because we may not be able to get through them all. Let me try to group together a few uh, questions. As Barbara, a future student of, uh, of SICE Europe, that asks, uh, what has uh, PIS's uh, performance been during the pandemic, and how satisfied are the Polish people about that? And then there are questions by Jakub and Jacek, uh, Jakub says, okay, uh, let's say PIS is removed from power. Uh, how do we undo all the damages to the Polish constitution and political culture? And uh, Jacek, I think, has the million dollar question that we comparative constitutionalists always try to, 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 to answer. Do you think any constitutional reforms that are adopted by Democrats, when, if they win one day, could prevent a similar situation in the future? Okay. Uh, let me start. So the first one was asked by Barbara. Barbara. And the, oh, yeah. OK. Uh, look, in terms of the outcome, uh, the uh, record of Polish government regarding uh, the pandemic locates it somewhere halfway in the European spectrum. If we judge it by standards, say, of number of vaccinations per 100,000, or number of deaths, or number of new cases, I think it's not the worst, certainly not, it's not uh, at the top. But the performance has been marred. So, so in a sense, it is, you cannot, I think, criticize PIS too much for the pandemic-related actions from that point of view. What you can re uh, criticize it is that there were certain clearly human-made mistakes and errors which were perfectly avoidable and which sadly aggravated the situation. And I'll mention three types of such. First of all, corruption. I mean, the pandemic gave rise to some horrible cases of corruption uh, and maybe I shouldn't say it openly, so I don't want to mention the men because I don't want to have a new defamation case, but a very important minister involved here turned out to giving very high orders, say for face masks, uh, to his friends, for example, to his skiing instructor. And then th these face masks turned out to be uh, useless. I mean, typical stuff of corruption and graft. That's one thing. Second thing is that the, for many months, and even up to now, but now it's less maybe urgent, the government, and especially Kaczynski, refused to call the state of emergency and use the constitutional state of emergency of national, natural calamity sort of uh, proviso, which would, legally speaking, help dealing with a number of issues such as the elections, and uh, there were good reasons not to hold presidential elections when they were held, or not to plan pre pa uh, presidential elections for May, which was the height of, of the pandemic, but for purely political reason, Kaczynski decided to disregard clear constitutional mandate, which we had. And the third is that the, that the sort of day-to-day -day responses by the at a more administrative level were chaotic. Uh, so that the government kept closing some shops, but keeping open others, you know, without any plan. So at some point, uh, like gyms would be closed, but discos would be opened or 
vice versa. I mean, I don't remember all the examples. There wasn't a very clear coherent plan of lockdown. And, but I think it's the case also in many other West European countries. For example, I'm told by friends in France, you know, you never know why Macron overnight decides to close this, but reopen that, you know, and, uh, but that, that also happened in... Sorry, Wojciech, I can just butt in to ask, was there any denial of, the, of COVID by any of the members of Kaczynski's party? No, not, no. not anymore. Yeah. Not anymore, but Kaczynski himself implicitly denied that it's a natural disaster. And in Polish law, because he didn't want to activate that law under the constitution. In Polish law, natural disaster includes explicitly uh, epidemic and pandemic uh, events. So uh, there was an implicit uh, denial. But no, no one went, say, as far as ex-president Donald Trump would say, you know, right. not you know, it will all finish very soon, etc. No. Uh, to Jakub about, yeah, you know, we all, so, so the question was, suppose tomorrow or in 2023, which probably realistically is the nearest time because that's when there will be next parliamentary election, peace loses. What are we, liberal Democrats, constitutional Democrats, are going to do? To undo. Well, first of all, I wouldn't like to be in the shoes of people who will be in charge of it. It will be so incredibly complex and difficult. There are all sorts of plans. I mean, there are all sorts of projects about how to undo. I have proposed in one of my articles in Gazeta Wyborcza a set of uh, sort of a compass. You know, we should adopt three principles in this order. A, everything in accordance with constitution. There is no extraordinary extra constitutional measure. B, try to have a counterfactual. Where would the institutions be today if there weren't uh, many actions of unconstitutional breaches? You know? So restore people who are properly elected to the constitutional tribunal and remove all those judges who, and so on. It, it's difficult, but it can be done. So we need just to imagine at which point we would be now if all this deformations of constitution haven't taken place since late 2015. And the third one, the third principle, is actual criminal and, and political liability of people guilty of committing crimes and offenses. For example, so-called bureaucratic offense, etc. So I, it's, it's perhaps the least important, and I don't want people to somehow uh, focus attention on this one because it would be like a you know, vin vindictive approach. But I think, you know, that these three general principles more or less identify where I stand on. The most important is everything done under the constitution. And to Jacek's question, a simple answer is no. You cannot have a constitution which will defend itself against violators of the constitution. Because in the end, the best, even the best constitution is just a piece of paper. Uh, it's a parchment barrier, as famously American founding fathers Called it. So how, how strong barrier is if it's made, made of parchment or of paper? But of course, it doesn't mean that constitutional design does not matter. Of course, yeah. Very specific issues. There may be better designs and there'll be worse designs. For example, the fact that Polish constitution did not say explicitly in so many words that judicial members of National Council of Judiciary are elected by judges. I mean, the fact that, because it was taken for granted, it was taken as being obvious, so that, you know, it can be read between the lines. And the, what the autocrats do, they say, look, if some, uh, something is not said explicitly in the constitution, then it means that there is no constitutional provision about it, and therefore we have full leeway. You know? But there are such things as constitutional conventions and unwritten norms, but they don't respect it. So as much of these type of things should be written. They still could obviously, breach it, but it would, it would make it a little bit more costly, a little bit more difficult. Of course, you can have better ways of appointing judges of constitutional tribunal. If we had something like in Italy, where, where you have, you know, this tripartite division. Yeah, mixed system. Or between different bodies, still, they could achieve their effect because they could basically control this vote. But it will make it much more difficult when, when all the are simply elected by simple majority of the lower chamber. It's the worst possible constitutional design you can have. So I just give you details. But these are details, these are things at the margin. In the end, there is no, 
There is no breach proof constitutional design and the constitution will not defend itself against those who are strongly committed to break it. And if, if those people do not feel that they will be punished for it by their electors, they will do it. Wojciech, uh, I, I would almost say to be continued because the number of questions that are continuing to come in, we have had a very, very active audience. In fact, I would like to thank everyone who's been following this webinar. It's, this is evidently a topic that uh, people are very interested in. So at this point, uh, and I will take the opportunity that hopefully to be able to have you in Bologna and always to invite you out to dinner and so on, we will, uh, we will replicate this uh, sometime in the, in the near future. Uh, but for now, I really would like to thank you. And mm -hmm. uh, it's been a great webinar. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Justin. Thank you, all members of your team. And of course, thank you, the audience that you decided to come regardless of the dinner time now. <laughs> <laughs> Grazie mille. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Arrivederci. Grazie. Arrivederci. Thanks a lot, Wojciech. Thank bye -bye. you very much. Thank we'll you very much, time. Justin. That was great pleasure, great fun. Great. Thank you. Anytime. Let's repeat. Yeah, we must. Un abbraccio. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Ciao. Arrivederci. Ciao. Arrivederci.